Eagle 95.1, WUPN, Paradise, Sault Ste. Marie. It's time for The Game. Eagle 95.1 proudly brings you The Game, the Twin Zoo's only regional and national sports show. For the next hour, we'll get an in-depth look at sports in the eastern Upper Peninsula and Algoma region and hear from coaches and players involved in The Game. Now, let's join Scott Nason at the Wicked Sister on Ashman Street in downtown Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan for tonight's broadcast of The Game on Eagle 95.1. Time to play the game. Time to play the game. and salutations and welcome to the game on this Monday night, October 8th, 2018. Scott Nason broadcasting from the studios of Eagle 95.1 WUPN and online at thegamesportshow.com or thegamesportshow.podbean.com. Now normally we're at the Wicked Sister on Monday nights, our host, but they have close the doors at the Wicked Sister tonight due to a fundraiser for Dancing with the Stars all in support of Hospice House of the Eastern Upper Peninsula so we are broadcasting from the studios but we're still going to have a lot of sports information, local, regional, and national sports information. And we'll be joined around 6.30 by Butch Davis from Butch on Sports, who will get us up to date on what's going on in the Metro Detroit sports world, including a big win by the Detroit Lions yesterday afternoon at Ford Field. And then we'll have our round table around 7, myself, Butch Davis and E.J. Russell, Cleveland sports enthusiasts from Escanaba, Michigan, will be joining us. And, well, we're hoping to be joined by Dave McKeg, co-host of The Game from The Wicked Sister and host of The Game Sports Show from Sports Center Bar and Grill, along with Northern Superior Brewing Company and Silver Creek Golf Course. Now, happy Thanksgiving to all our Canadian listeners. We'll see how long it takes Dave to finish his Thanksgiving meal. He's not 100% sure if he can join us, but we definitely are looking forward to him if he does. But first and foremost, let's get everyone caught up to date on what's going on in the world of local sports. And let's begin with high school football from this past weekend in a game you heard on Eagle 95.1 with Todd Olmstead. It was the Ingadine Eagles punching their playoff ticket and continuing their long streak of weather bowl victories on Friday night as the Eagles got off to a slow start before taking control in the second half and posting a 57-20 win over the Brimley Bays in Great Lakes 8 East Division football game. Ingenite is now eligible for the playoffs at 6-1. Brimley led 20-14 in the second half before Ingenite started to roll. Ingenite's quarterback, Andrew Blanchard, with 7 of 11 passing for 158 yards and 3 touchdowns. He also ran for 76 yards and 1 touchdown. Kyle Gould, he had a big night. 215 yards rushing on 19 carries and 2 touchdowns, while Hunter Dennis, he also Had a lot of yards on the ground, 146 yards on its 17 carries and two touchdowns. Dennis and Jonah Miller also had scoring touchdowns for Engadine, while Mason Harris had a pair of touchdown runs for the Brimley Bays, who fall to 1-6 on the season. Engadine will host Rapid River on Friday, while Brimley will have their home finale taking on... Well, a very good opponent in the number one team in all the state of Michigan in eight-player football, the Pickford Panthers. All the call of that game Friday night, starting with the pregame show at 645, 
the opening kickoff at 7 on Eagle 95.1 WUPN or online at Radio Eagle Sioux. That's S-O-O dot com. The Cedarville Trojans, they dropped a 28-20 decision at home Friday night to Rapid River to fall to 4-3 and on the season. Quarterback Tristan Masuga for the Trojans, 14 of 32 passing for 280 yards and three touchdowns. Masuga tossed a touchdown pass of 33 yards to Gunnar Fountain, 74 yards to Ch- Trey Pockan, and 13 yards to Seth Bale all in the first half. Cedarville now 4-3, and three, and they're going to need two wins to guarantee themselves a spot in the eight-player football playoffs. One win may do it. They could sneak in at 5-4. and four. And they're probably going to have to get Friday night's game as they'll be at Rudyard on Friday before finishing the season at Pickford. So if Cedarville is going to get the win, they need two. But they definitely want to get the one in Rudyard on Friday night. St. Ignace kept their playoff hopes alive in 11-player football in Northern Michigan Football Alliance Legacy Division play at home Friday night as they rolled over winless Indian River Inland Lakes by the score of 42-10. to St. Ignace sophomore Garrett Rickley ran for 276 yards along with three touchdowns on 27 carries. He also caught three passes for 63 yards and a touchdown. Ryan Levesque added 120 yards on 12 carries and one touchdown for the Saints, who had over 400 yards of rushing offense. Now St. Ignace at 4-3, and three, they're going to need a couple wins in their last two games to make the playoffs. And they have a tough one at home on Friday against 6-1 and one Rogers City, who we'll talk more about in a moment. And they'll have their regular season finale also at home against Gaylord St. Mary's. Newberry out of playoff contention, lost a game at home to Bark River Harris on Friday by the score of 29-22. to Newberry now 2-5 and five on the season. They'll have their home finale on Friday where they will take on Johannesburg Lewiston. The Sioux High Blue Devils' chance at the playoffs took a major setback on Friday night at Rogers City as the Hurons defeated the Sioux High Blue Devils for a 20-16 win. So Sioux High sits 4-3 and three on the season, and they have a chance to make the postseason, but they're going to win, need two wins, including at home Friday night against winless Indian River Inland Lakes. Then they'll finish the season at home against Gaylord. Gaylord dropped a tough matchup this weekend to Petoskey. So the Blue Devils and St. Ignace still have playoff aspirations along with Cedarville, but all those teams are going to need some wins. Rudyard, they're out of playoff contention, you would think, at 3-4, and four, although there is a slight chance they could sneak in at 5-4. and four. Well, they helped their cause on Saturday at Carney Nadeau, winning on the road 76-32. to So the Bulldogs are going to need a couple wins, including at home Friday against Cedarville. Well, we know Pickford is in the playoffs, and we know they're going to host uh, probably a bunch of games. Looking for their first ever state championship in eight-player football, they improved to 7-0 and remain the number one team in all the state of Michigan on Saturday as they took on Superior Central at Eben Junction and rolled over the Cougars by the score of 70-22. to Ain't no stopping this Pickford team, at least in the regular season, and Brimley will try to stop the Panthers on Friday night as Pickford will take on Brimley. Again, you can hear that game on Eagle 95.1. Sioux Ontario High School football from this past week, it was the Cora Colts clinching first place in the senior high school division as they improved to 5-0 with a 38-23 win over St. Mary's on Friday night at Superior Heights. Tyler Bretchen had a big day for the Colts, caught four passes for 88 yards, also a couple touchdown passes while running in another as Nick Gervasi, he had 12 carries for 113 yards for Cora, including a touchdown run of 13 yards, and Cora quarterback Jordan Robinson Wright, a guest on the Game Sports Show with Dave McKegg last month, he threw for 218 yards in the win, completing 10 of 18 passes. With White Pines folding at the senior level, St. Mary's will not have a game next week as the Knights were scheduled to face the Wolverines on Thursday night, while Cora will wrap up the regular season at home on Friday night. Actually, I should say at Superior Heights, taking on them. Superior Heights 2-3. and three on the season. Let's move on to high school cross country. This past Monday, the Newberry boys edged out Brimley on a tiebreaker to take top honors in the second leg of the EUP conference jamboree on Monday. 
The tiebreaker was based on senior Jack Fillmore, Newberry's number six runner. He placed 20th in the 3.1 mile race at 20 minutes, 10 seconds, while Brimley's sixth runner was 26, so you can't get much closer than that. Rudyard finished third for the boys. Brimley's junior Austin Plotkin earned top individual honors for the boys once again, running the 3.1 mile race at 17 minutes flat. That's fast. Followed by Cedarville junior Thomas Bone and Newberry sophomore Epperin Evans. For the girls, the Saints won the meet on Monday, followed by Cedarville and Ingenine. St. Ignace senior Elizabeth Becker was the girls champion, finishing just a hair over 20 minutes. She was followed by sophomore teammate Hallie Marshall at second. Cedarville's Liliana Kaysen at third. Ingenine freshman Leah Gould at fourth. And Cedarville's Zoe Ator finishing fifth. Over the weekend, the Sioux High Blue Devils boys team celebrated their only home cross-country meet of the year, finishing first place at the 22nd Annual Elks Invitational on Saturday. Placing six runners in the top ten, all under 18 minutes, the Blue Devils scored 30 points for the victory. Jason Wyman was fourth for the Blue Devils with a time of 17 minutes, 18 seconds, while Cedarville's Thomas Bone was the top EUP individual finisher. Excuse me. South Lion won the girls' meet with 35 points, followed by Harbor Springs. Sioux High was third with Sioux High's Haley Knowles finishing second overall in the meet. Now, all schools are scheduled to run in the Straits Area Conference Jamboree at Rudyard on Tuesday. We also had some high school soccer on Tuesday. The Sioux High Blue Devils shut out Manistique 8 to nothing on Tuesday, and they'll have their home finale tomorrow against the Sheboygan Chiefs with the departing seniors being honored at halftime. Some high school volleyball from this past week on Tuesday. The Sioux High Blue Devils defeated Boyne City by 3 to 1 count. Brimley over Engadine also by 3 to 1 count. And Pickford over Detour by a 3-2 to two count as, well, we're getting uh, pretty close to the conference championships in high school volleyball. And, of course, we'll have the regionals coming on at the end of the month, districts and regionals. So good luck to all the high school athletes as October, a very busy month ending the regular season and getting ready for the postseason. We're going to take our first break on the game and continue our local sports roundup. We come back, we got a lot to talk about from the world of junior hockey. The Sioux Greyhounds were on the road 4-3 this week out east. The Sioux Eagles and Sioux Thunderbirds in action, and the Sioux Indians winning a big tournament down at Compuware. We'll talk about that and Laker athletics coming up, including the Laker hockey team starting the season. On the good note, not once, but twice out east. We'll also talk Laker tennis, volleyball, cross country, and more. That's coming up on the game here on Eagle 95.1. Get Wicked Catering from the crew at the Wicked Sister. We like to think of ourselves as foodies. While our favorite foods are paired with a beer tasting at the Wicked Sister, you can now have the same creative menu for your next catered business luncheon, family get-together, wedding, or holiday party. Our white truffle risotto appeals to your gluten-free and vegetarian guests. Add sautéed shrimp or freshly grilled chicken for a pop of protein. Or let us build you a custom menu to suit your needs. From plated events of 15 to buffets for 200, the Wicked Sister will cater your event with tapas, snacks, craveables, or a full sit-down dinner. The Wicked Sister, where you'll be treated like family, whether you like it or not. The Game Sports Show would like to thank an additional sponsor and additional home to the Game Sports Show, Sports Center Bar and Grill. Sports Center Bar and Grill, located on 624 Wellington Street West, Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Sports Center rated top sports bar for the second year in a row. At Sports Center, enjoy their famous 75-cent wing night along with delicious Molson products on tap, along with a great atmosphere and other great food options available as well. Sports Center Bar and Grill, the Sioux's best sports bar. The Game Sports Show would like to thank an additional sponsor and special edition home to the game, Silver Creek Golf Course, located on 104 Bello Lake Road, Garden River, Ontario. And also a shout-out thank you to Silver Creek GM, Jamie Henderson. Silver Creek Golf Course has many specials to offer for 18 holes, 9 holes, and even Twilight Deal specials. It does not matter what your level of golf game is, it is a must to enjoy the scenic course, memorable experiences that Silver Golf Course offers. Silver Creek also offers a Thursday wing night for you to enjoy food after a stellar time on the course. You can book your tea time by phone or online at golfsilvercreek.com. Silver Creek Golf Course, where all are welcome to play.
Welcome back to the game on Eagle 95.1 and online at thegamesportshow.com, thegamesportshow.podbean.com, or if you happen to be a YouTube person, we're also on YouTube. Just look up the Scott Nason channel. Scott Nason broadcasting from the studios of Eagle 95.1 on this Monday night in the Twin Sioux. Our normal location, the Wicked Sister, is having a fundraiser for hospice. We'll be back there in a couple weeks. Now, we won't have a show next week, next Monday, October 15th. So our next game from the Wicked Sister will be on Monday, October 22nd. We'll be joined here in a a few minutes by Butch Davis from Butch on Sports, who will get us up to date on what's going on in the Metro Detroit sports scene. Then coming up in the second hour, our roundtable, including myself, Butch Davis, E.J. Russell, and possibly Dave McKegg, host of the Game Sports Show from Sioux, Ontario. Let's continue our local sports roundup, and let's focus on junior hockey. For this segment, the Sioux Greyhounds were on their longest trip of the season, their longest road trip of the season. Starting off on Thursday, they fell to the Peterborough Peets by the score of 5-2, to two, giving up four third-period goals. Morgan Frost and Zach Trott scored the goals for the Hounds who gave up 44 shots on goal with Matthew Villalta taking the loss on Thursday. The Hounds would rebound in Kingston on Friday, the former stomping grounds of one of our contributors, Brad Cochimilio from Sudaday.com. Rookie netminder Ethan Taylor earned his first win in net for the Hounds on Friday as the Hounds defeated the Frontenacs by the score of 4-1. to one. Jordan Sambrook, Mac Hollowell, Ryan O'Rourke, and Rory Cairns scored for the Hounds. They were in action yesterday afternoon in the nation's capital, known as Ottawa, and it was all 67s as the Hounds dropped the final game of their three-game road trip on Sunday afternoon, losing at Ottawa by the school score rather of 6-2. to two. Matthew Villalta, he gave up six goals on 20 shots before he was pulled in the second period. Roman Puchek and Morgan Frost scored the goals for the Hounds, who are now 3-3-1 three, three and one on the season. Now, they've only had one home game, but they're going to get three home games this week, including Wednesday, as they'll host the winless Flint Firebirds. They'll also be at home on Friday night, taking on the undefeated Kitchener Rangers and home Sunday afternoon against North Bay. Let's move on to the NOJHL. The Sioux Eagles and Sioux Thunderbirds both in action. Well, it was a tale of two different weekends. We'll start with the not-so-good as the Eagles lost a pair of games over the weekend, including on Friday, a tough loss to the Espinola Express by the score of 3-1. to one. Espinola's goaltender, Joel Rainville, he made 40 saves to earn the victory for the Express, just their second of the season. Kyle Quinn scored the only goal for the Eagles on Friday night, while netminder Joseph Benedetto made 30 saves in net for the loss for the Hounds. And they had a game on Saturday at home against Blind River, a team they've already beaten twice in two games, well, they didn't beat them three times in three games, and it was the Beavers with a 3-1 to one win on Saturday at Puller Stadium. Ethan Graham's goal in the second period proved to be the winner. Cam Parrott scored his first ever goal for the Sioux Eagles, and it was the only goal that they would score for the Eagles, who have now lost three straight, just scoring three goals in their last three games. And their record is 4-7. and seven. They'll look to turn it around this week as they will be in action at the NOJHL Showcase in Sudbury starting tomorrow afternoon. They will take on French River at 1 o'clock. They'll also take on Hearst Wednesday morning at 11.15, and they'll be at home on Saturday. I'll be doing that game for Hockey TV against the defending NLJHL champion and host of this year's Dudley Hewitt Cup, the Cochrane Crunch. And you can hear the podcasts of... Our hockey TV broadcast, the audio portion for the Sioux Eagles home games on the GameSportsShow.Podbean.com. Well, the Sioux Thunderbirds continued their fantastic play to start the season as they had a pair of games over the weekend and won them both, including on Friday night, or excuse me, on Saturday night, the Thunderbirds were in action, and they defeated Espinola by the score of 5-1. to one. Lucas Terrio, boy, is this guy having a great start to the season. He had his first NLJHL hat trick on Saturday night. He also had an assist for his efforts. Nick Smith had a goal and two assists for the Thunderbirds on Saturday night. William Anderson made 19 saves for the win, and the Thunderbirds are a perfect 9-0 to start the season 
as they were in action yesterday afternoon, rather yesterday evening, as they took on Elliott Lake and defeated the Wildcats by the score of five to two. Tristan Cicello, Nick Smith, Ryan Lawrence, Jamie Dan- Damanagi, and Brendan Miller all had goals for the Thunderbirds, while Colin Ahern made it 32 saves for the win. So the T-Birds 9-0 and and just announced today the number one team in all of Canada in the latest Canadian Junior Hockey rankings, which were announced today. The Thunderbirds at 1, Powassan at 4, and Kirkland Lake. They're at 15, the three NOJHL teams. Thunderbirds will have three games, four games rather, this week, including games at the NOJHL Showcase where they will take on Powassan Tuesday at 345. They'll also take on the Cochrane Crunch Wednesday, 645. Then they'll be at home this Saturday and Sunday taking on Rayside Balfour and Cochrane once again on Sunday. So the Th- Sioux Thunderbirds, the number one team in all of junior hockey and their forward Nick Smith, he was named one of the Eastlink TV three stars of the week. As skating for his hometown, Sioux Thunderbirds, Smith opened with his third multi-point night of the season with a goal and two assists, as I mentioned, for the Thunderbirds on Saturday against Espinola, and he scored once more on Sunday, and he's had four straight games where he has scored, and the 19-year-old is playing at over a point-per-game pace for the Thunderbirds so far this year with six goals, five assists for nine contests, and this Thunderbirds team, they mean business that. No question is has been answered here over the first nine games. You can hear more about the Thunderbirds with Dave McKegg and his crew from Northern Superior Brewing Company. They're going to have lots of Thunderbirds information this year, including they're going to have some pregame and postgame interviews, along with interviews with the coaches and more. And you can hear Dave McKegg on this podcast page and the game sports show dot podbean dot com we were hoping to have some guests from the Sioux Indians but due to our location change we're going to bump that to a couple weeks as the Sioux Indians were at the CompuWare Invitational and they came away with the title how about that congratulations to the Sioux Thunderbirds as they won the title yesterday in the championship game of the CompuWare Honey Baked Silver Division Saw the Indians face off in a rematch with the Amherst Knights from New York. The Indians would jump out to the early lead in the first period when Colton Haynes opened the scoring. The shot on top circle was assisted by Griffin Hernelstein and Trevor Prince. Four minutes later, Adam Brzezinski got on the board with an assist from Luke Perry. Don't know if he's related to the guy from 90210, but if he is, more power to him. The Indians went up 3 to nothing in the first period before Amherst would score two goals to get back in the action, but the Indians would get a big insurance goal as Trevor Prince found an open net as the Indians played and won the CompuWare tournament with a 4 2 win on Sunday. Dakota Mayer earned the win in net for the Indians as the Indians will be back in Detroit next weekend playing Honey Baked on Friday before traveling to Troy to take on the Oakland Grizzlies Saturday and Sunday morning. So congratulations to the Sioux Indians, winners of the CompuWare Tournament this weekend. We're going to take another break here on the game. We come back, we're going to talk Lake Superior State University athletics, including hockey, volleyball, cross country, and tennis, coming up on the game here on Eagle 95.1. The Wicked Sister, Sioux, Michigan. Check TripAdvisor, ranked right towards the top. Awarded the Certificate of Excellence, as well as voted number one pub in the UP. The Wicked Sister has managed to create a casual menu that offers unique, creative, and sometimes healthy offerings that rivals menu selections of any big city. Burgers and starters, snacks and shareables, soups and salads, sandwiches and tapas. On Ashman Street, Sioux, Michigan. Welcome to the Wicked Sister, where you'll be treated like family, whether you like it or not. The Game Sports Show is pleased to shout out a partner, additional home, and sponsor to Northern Superior Brewing Company, located on 50 Pym Street in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Northern Superior Brewing Company having a strong presence locally with many beers to offer. With much involvement in the community of Sault Ste. Marie, Northern has a sport and friendly-like atmosphere within its tap room, and during the summer months, it is a must to visit Pier 55 to enjoy some delicious food, amazing view of the water, and view of the Bush Pulley Museum right on the cusp of the Hub Trail, and of course, all of that down with a delicious brew from Northern Superior. Northern Superior Brewing company it's a northern thing
Welcome back to the game on Eagle 95.1 and online at thegamesportshow.com, thegamesportshow.podbean.com, or on YouTube. Just look for the Scott Nason channel. Scott Nason broadcasting on this rainy Monday night from the studios of Eagle 95.1. We'll be back at our location on Ashman Street, known as the Wicked Sister, in two weeks on Monday, October 22nd. They're having a fundraiser tonight at the Wicked Sister for Hospice of the EUP. And next week, I will be out of town. So you have a couple weeks to wait for our latest edition of the game. Coming up in our next segment, we'll be talking to Butch Davis from Butch on Sports, who had a very busy weekend covering the Lions, the Red Wings, the Pistons, high school football, college football, and more. And then we'll have our roundtable in Hour 2. Yours truly, along with Butch, E.J. Russell, Cleveland sports enthusiast from Escanaba, Michigan, and possibly... Just possibly Dave McKegg from Sioux, Ontario. A very happy Columbus Day and Canadian Thanksgiving to all. And a very happy weekend for Laker Athletics, especially their hockey team, as they started the season at Merrimack. Now, these are the first games against Merrimack College since back in 1988 when the Lakers and Merrimack played a two-game total goal series In the quarterfinals at the Norris Center, back when it was the Norris Center, the Lakers would advance from that series to win their first ever national championship in 1988. Well, the two teams met for the first time on Saturday night, and the Lakers started the season, their 53rd season on Saturday, with a 5-4 road win. Anthony Nellis scored four minutes to play, with four minutes to play on a penalty shot for the game winner, as the Lakers led 4-2, but gave up a couple goals to be tied before the goal by Nellis. Diego Cuglietta had a pair of power play goals for the Lakers, while Braden Geslinger also had a shorthanded goal, and Max Hummets scored on the power play. Special teams definitely working for the Lakers on Saturday. Nick Kossoff made 28 saves in net, earning the win on Saturday night. And the Lakers followed up that performance on Saturday, a much lower scoring game on Sunday, and it was Max Hummets, who was the Lakers' leading scorer last year, Well, he found the back of the net with less than a minute to play in the second period. And Lakers goaltender Markins Mittens stopped all 31 shots he faced as the Lakers earned the 1-0 win on Sunday and the weekend sweep of the Merrimack College squad. Now the Lakers will return home to Taffy Abel Arena this weekend for a two-game exhibition set against Nipissing College. Those games are Friday and Saturday night. Literally hot off the presses, the WCHA have named their Players of the Week for this past weekend, October 6th and 7th, and a couple Lakers were named Players of the Week, including the WCHA Goaltender of the Week, Marcus Mitten, sophomore from Lake Superior State University, one of only three goaltenders to earn a shutout on the opening weekend and to post a clean sheet on the road. Mittens was sensational in the Lakers' 1-0 sweep clinching win on Sunday. After not playing on Saturday, the sophomore turned aside all 31 shots he faced, including 25 after the Lakers scored the lone goal 30 seconds into the second period. Mittens' first shutout, actually his second shutout in his first career WCHA weekly award from the late native from Latvia. And also mentioned, uh, honorable mention, for forward of the week, Max Hummets, who had a pair of goals, including the lone goal on Sunday. So a great start for the Hockey Lakers. Let's hope it continues here over the weekend and throughout this season. Lots of Laker athletics at home this weekend, including volleyball. Uh, the Lakers took on a couple GLIAC opponents, including Davenport on Friday it was Davenport winning by a three sets to none count. Junior Amanda Reed had 14 kills to lead the Laker offense. Freshman Kelly Walter had six. Leading the Lakers in assists was senior center Lauren Lusikic, who had 13, while freshman Hallie Grolke tallied nine. The Lakers were in action on Saturday. Took the first set from Grand Valley, but the Grand Valley Lakers would defeat LSSU by three to one count. With the loss, the Lakers' record falls to 3-15. and Junior Amanda Reed led the Lakers in kills once again with 16, followed by freshman Bethany Wilson tallying 10. The Lakers will return to action next weekend as they travel to Indianapolis to participate in the GLIAC Great Lakes Valley Conference crossover. 
And they'll be back at home October 26th and 27th as they will host Northwood and Northern Michigan. Laker women's tennis team on the, I should say, on the home courts this weekend, and they lost a tough one on Saturday to Grand Valley State by a 4-3 to three count. The Lakers would start the match strong as they won number one doubles. Tara Harvey and Nadege Kua lost six to four, while number two doubles Alexis Andruin and Margot Miller won seven to five. Senior Janae Andrews and Allison Granville won the battle at number three doubles. In the singles portion, Druin won at number one. Number two singles, Kua lost. Harvey lost at number three. Muller won all three sets at number four. And the number five single spots, Keegan Malpass lost. Rounding up the lineup was Granville at six singles, and she fell in straight sets. And the Lakers would get a big win on Sunday in GLIAC action as they won their first match against Fair State since 2012. As the Lakers won by the score of 5-2, to two, they continued their solid doubles play Sunday morning, taking the point away from Ferris. In number one doubles, Tara Harvey and Nadeke Kua won 6-3, while at number two doubles, Alexis Andruin and Margot Muller won 7-5. Ferris State would win at number three doubles, but the Lakers would keep the momentum rolling in singles. Druin won 6-2, 6-1 at number one singles. Kua won 6-3, 6-3 at number two. And Harvey won a three-set thriller, winning 6-4 in the third. At number four singles, Muller won in straight sets. Number five, Andrews would fall to Ferris in a tiebreaker, while number six, Allison Granville lost 7-5, 7-5. So the Lakers will travel downstate next weekend to visit Purdue Northwest on Saturday and Davenport on Sunday. Now, if the Lakers can win over Purdue Northwest, they will clinch a spot in the GLIAC tournament. And finally, let's end this segment with Laker Cross Country. We heard from their assistant coach a couple weeks ago. The Laker men's and women's cross country teams completed the Hillsdale College Invitational on Saturday where both teams finished second place. In the men's 8,000-meter race, David Mitter placed second overall and secured the fastest time for the Lakers with a time of 26 minutes, 54 seconds. Garrett Smith had the next best time for the Lakers, finishing at fifth. In the women's 5,000-meter race, Lake Spear State was led by Alexis Pacino's time of 21 minutes, 33 seconds, which placed her 11th, while Lydia Hymanen placed 12th for Lake State. The Lake State will head to Detroit to participate in the Wayne State Invitational on October 20th. So that is a very busy local sports roundup, but that is not all the sports we will talk about tonight. We're just getting started, including coming up next, we'll be talking to Butch Davis, co-host of this show and host of his show, Butch on Sports, which you can find on our podcast page or on the web page of the game, thegamesportshow.com. But you're going to talk about that big Lions victory at home against Green Bay. Also talk about the Red Wings start to the season. College football, high school football, Pistons exhibition basketball. Who knows, maybe we'll even talk about the WWE Super Show, which happened in Australia this weekend. That's coming up next on The Game here on Eagle 95.1. Get Wicked at Wicked Sister. You'll find the best tasting food for you and your family. Start off with some wicked appetizers like the crab dip served with soft pretzel bites and warm non-bread strips and delicious boneless chicken wings that are antibiotic and hormone free with five choices of sauces. Try the barbecue pulled pork sandwich or the number one selling drunken cow burger and the chicken caprice flatbread. Check out the Wicked Sister gluten-free menu and catering the wicked sister downtown ashman street seven days a week the game sports show would like to thank a list of additional sponsors north shore sports and auto new location located on 647 mcdonald avenue sault st marie a family owned and operated business with doing business in sault st marie for over 10 years loads of products available for your enjoyment for all seasons north shore sports and auto we understand the importance of quality service and products and we work hard to ensure that all customers have a positive experience before and after each and every sale North Shore Sports and Auto, meeting all of your new and pre-owned equipment needs. Special thanks to Salon. The Salon, located on 589 Second Line East, Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Owned and operated by Mike Cuglietta. Book your appointment today at 705-941-9191 or via online at https colon dash dash the salon dot as dot me dash. The Salon, making the Sioux beautiful one haircut at a time. As well as a shout out to the Superior Pro Shop. 
the Superior Pro Shop, located inside a Community First Credit Union Superior Arena on 285 Northern Avenue East to St. Marie, Ontario. Owned and operated by Jeremy Paquin and ran by Larry Monroe. The Superior Pro Shop, for over 40 years, meet all of your skate sharpening, skate repair, and hockey needs. Also to discover the canvas, discover the canvas, located on 317 Wellington Street West to St. Marie, Ontario. A beautiful new renovated building owned and operated by expert artist and Sioux native Katrina Tipito. Katrina taking her talents of the ink in Sioux St. Marie and truly creating the best and most realistic art locally. Call Katrina today at 705-450-8099 or email her at discoverthecanvas at gmail.com to book your tattoo or consultation today. Welcome back to the game on Eagle 95.1 and online at thegamesportshow.com, thegamesportshow.podbean.com, or go to YouTube and look up the Scott Nason channel. Scott Nason broadcasting from the studios of Eagle 95.1 on Ashman Street in downtown Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Coming up in our next segment, we'll be joined by E.J. Russell, Cleveland sports enthusiast and a guest on our roundtable including myself and our next guest, weekly contributor, co-host. His name is William Davis III. We like to call him Butch, and he is host of a show you can hear on our podcast and webpage, thegamesportshow.com. His show is called Butch on Sports, where you can hear about what's going on in the Metro Detroit sports world. Butch joins us each and every week to give us his insight, comment, and firsthand knowledge of what's going on in Detroit, Butch. How are you doing on this uh, Canadian Thanksgiving in Columbus Day? Happy Thanksgiving to you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I was waiting for that there, you know, uh, get to the, all the festivities and whatnot here in a moment, you know, per se. But uh, doing just great here. How are you doing, Scott? Doing wonderful, Butch. Always love having you on our show, Talking Sports. Our usual contributor, Dave McKegg, will not be joining us this week, Butch. He's having a big meal with his family. You know how those Italians get for big meals on Canadian Thanksgiving. He's going to probably be full for about a week, isn't he? Yeah, that's about a week. But uh, right, uh, the family came. Didn't I didn't have to go to the family up in Canada? The, the family came to us this uh, particular Thanksgiving. So after the show uh, from Philadelphia and beyond, I'm going to go meet um, a lot of my relatives that came in town and. Uh, and feast on some goodies and all this other good stuff there. Fantastic, Butch. Not, let's not waste any time and get right to the sports that you can't get enough of, including the Detroit mm-hmm. Lions. As the Lions took advantage of quite a few mistakes, forcing the Green Bay Packers to a 24 nothing deficit at one point at Ford Field as Matthew Stafford threw for two touchdown passes. LeGarrette Blount ran for two scores lifting the Lions to a 31-23 to victory over the Green Bay Packers. Detroit effective in the red zone, 4-for-4, four four, including four touchdowns. They ran the ball. They didn't turn over the ball, Butch, and they looked much like they did uh, three weeks ago against New England, like a complete football team. The Lions, 2-3, and three, have a bye next week before resuming action at Miami. Butch, Lions over Packers, your thoughts? Well, I'm not going to be that gracious to the Detroit I Lions. <laughs> I would not. I can't. I can't. Uh, you know, let's thank the field goal kicker of, and uh, extra point kicker of the Green Bay Packers Damn. for making it all possible for the Detroit Lions there because they almost got shot in the foot. It was very, very humbling to hear about that the Lions were last in the NFL in red zone efficiency there, but they tried to do their very best, and they did when they got opportunities to score, and that's something that I'm going to, you know, stand up and, and holler about there. They did take advantage of the opportunities of scoring there when Green Bay was shooting itself in the foot. Uh, an extraordinary game with the defense, per se. I felt that could have been a little bit better, but I was very, very proud of the job that the cornerbacks did. They're looking like cornerbacks of a championship team 
when they play the way they play there, and, uh, and I'm very, very happy with that. Very happy with the running game. I still say Johnson should, or the runners of the Detroit Lions should get the ball more. However, they did run the ball. When they did run the ball, they ran it very efficiently there, and they kept Green Bay off, uh, off balance there. So very good game for them all together there. Let's move on to the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, you were at the home opener last Thursday where the Wings lost to Columbus 3-2 to in overtime. The Wings also in action last night, late night, losing at Los Angeles by the score of 4-2. to They'll be at Anaheim later tonight at 10 p.m. Butch, uh, your thoughts on the Detroit Red Wings start here very, very early into the season? Uh, <laughs> you know, I was very happy to see uh, the hustle when I uh, was down there uh, at Little Caesars Arena on Thursday there when they played. Uh, they played like a team that uh, is going to be a lot faster, a lot more physical. I was very, very, very gracious of seeing them protect their goaltender a lot better than I have in years past there. I'm very, very uh, intrigued in that, and hopefully that gets better. If that gets better, Unlike what they did last night, they didn't uh, protect Bernier that better at all. But uh, Thursday, they did an absolutely good job. Uh, they got a point out the deal, and that's nothing to snuff at there on Thursday. However, on when they went yesterday and played, um, I would give them maybe a C minus there. I can't say the travel woes got to them because they left out of town. Exactly on Friday, probably got to practice on Saturday and play yesterday and Sunday. Uh, going to play a back-to-back, so that's going to be somewhat something to look forward to and see if the Red Wings can still have those legs, those young legs, unlike some of the other teams in the NHL who may not have them, see if they bounce back and, and give uh, the Anaheim Ducks uh, something to look forward to as far as some competition there. Butch, let's move on to the Detroit Pistons. A week and a couple days away from their regular season or regular season opener, excuse me, Wednesday, October seventeenth, uh, hosting the Brooklyn Nets. Well, they're hosting the Brooklyn Nets here tonight in preseason basketball. They also have a game at home Wednesday against Washington at Cleveland on Friday. Butch, uh, it's, it's very very early with the Detroit Pistons. Anything that you've seen or anything of uh, significance to report? Not much. I, you know, I'm. Right now, you can tell that Casey is trying out all the young kids. He's been very careful about um, even playing Jackson, okay, because he's uh, he sat out the, next, the two games. And I don't expect him to do a whole heck of a lot here at home uh, when they play tonight and also maybe on Wednesday, which I'll try, try to get down there and see if I can take a, a wee look at the team in this uh, preseason ways and talk to the coach. But, again, uh that's going to be a, a, a progression that, you, you know, you got to wait and see. He's not really peddling on the veterans so much there. Andre Drummond has looked uh, the tip of shape in, uh, as he uh, has played some good games here. So far, so good. I, I'm glad to see that. He seems a lot stronger, a lot more um, uh, uh, lighter on the feet there. So, Again, you know, exhibition season, you can't put a lot of stock on there. I'm going to wait for the regular season. But, again, try to get down there Wednesday and take a wee look at them and, and see what goes on and, as far as them playing the young kids are concerned and, and, and getting them acclimated. I'm, I'm looking for better things for the Pistons than I have in quite some seasons past. Butch Davis joining us on the game. He'll continue to be with us for the roundtable coming up in hour two. Butch, you recapped a lot of high school football on your show, Butch on Sports, this weekend, which you can find at Butch on Sports. Excuse me, at Simply Butch 2, that's T-O-O dot Potomatic dot com, or on the game sports show dot com. We recapped what's going on in the world of high school football in this neck of the woods. We are getting down to the nitty gritty. Just two games left in the regular season. Uh, lots to shake out, and uh, we're going to be talking playoffs here in a couple weeks, aren't we? Yeah, we're talking playoffs probably uh, tomorrow on uh, Butch on Sports as I'm going to go and kind of reveal from up north where you're at until down south down here of the teams that already have put their little ticket in for the showdown of the uh, the districts 
in October, which is about maybe at three weeks away here and some change here. So, I'm, you know, a lot of teams are getting wound up here. Uh, we got a lot of qualifiers this week. Uh, very surprising. And right now this is the eighth week of, of play there. So there's not too much uh, time left for some teams to try to make it into the dance. Butch, let's move on to college football as both Michigan and Michigan State were in action over the weekend. And, well, Michigan, they did what they had to do, beating Maryland by the score of 42-21. to Shea Patterson, 282 yards, a season-high passing. The Wolverines improved to 5-1, and and they have a battle with Wisconsin coming up on Saturday at the Big House. And, well, it was a different story at Spartan Stadium. The Michigan State Spartans lost their third straight game to Northwestern. And most of the game looked completely lost, to be quite honest, on the offensive end as, well, it was Clayton Thorson uh, <coughs> torching the Michigan State defense, 373 yards, three touchdowns, as Wildcats improved to 2-3. and three. Michigan State falls to 3-2. and two. They'll be at Penn State on Saturday, and Butch had a chance to watch a lot of that game, and I know a lot of people very upset with Michigan State and their offensive coordinator and some of the play calling. This season is looking more like the 3-9 and nine season, at least what I saw Saturday, than what we've seen last season. Michigan State, uh, are, they're in a pretty tough spot right now coming up because they still got to play Penn State, Michigan, and Ohio State. And the way they look, I don't see them having any chance against any of those teams. Uh, I want to highly agree with you on that one there. Michigan State did not look like the team that has been advertised as a, a strong Big Ten contender there. They look very flat. I know that after party uh, at homecoming was not a, <laughs> what yeah. they're going to be expecting. <laughs> yeah, I know that for sure. Uh, we flopped that over to Michigan there. They started off a kind of uh, wacky there with the uh, uh, kickoff return. But they did fight back. Their defense did show up and, and play some absolutely some great uh, football there. Um, for Michigan, I'm, I'm looking for them to get a lot better. Not a lot worse. You can tell that Patterson's a lot more comfortable now in dealing with uh, some uh, some offense and you know being able to ab lib some of the, the the plays that kind of get whacked up there, and him being able to be a lot more mobile than uh, quarterbacks that pass uh, really helps Michigan right now a great deal. Plus, their running game is is getting better. So hopefully, Michigan. Uh, can uh, persevere their schedule because their schedule gets very, very tough. And, and I'm quite sure Michigan State right now is healing and licking some wounds, and they're going to either get the coming to Jesus meeting in their clubhouse there in order for them to get better there. Uh, you know, both teams are, are primed to go, you know, for some offseason play in there. Michigan State right now has to do a lot better in their offense there. Their offense is non-existent. Their defense does not look that good either there. So I can't just say the offensive coordinator should get a blame in far as the play calling is concerned. You know what I mean? You can either um, go along with the program and get the doggone job done, or you can't. But, again, the defense didn't look all that good either in that particular game. Butch, a couple more topics here before we get to the round table Major League Baseball playoffs. Uh, we'll be talking to E.J. Russell here in a few minutes. He's going to have some good news, and, well, we have some bad news. As Browns won, which we'll talk about in an hour or two, but his Indians were eliminated from the Major League Baseball playoffs this afternoon as Houston put a whooping on the try by a score of 11-3. to They advanced to take on the winner of Boston and the New York Yankees. That series tied at 1. That'll be played a little bit later on as we're recording this show on Monday evening. Milwaukee is through. They swept the Colorado Rockies yesterday. The Dodgers and Atlanta playing in Game 4 right now in the bottom of the 6th. The Dodgers lead Atlanta 3-2. to uh, Butch, have you had a chance to watch much of the Major League Baseball playoffs? And if you watch over the past few days, boy, Houston, Milwaukee, they're playing some good ball right now. Right. I got to see Saturdays and Sundays games there. And uh, Milwaukee right now, looks like nobody can beat them up there. Uh, They're going to be very competitive. Whoever comes out there, Dodgers and um, Atlanta Braves series. Don't count on Atlanta there too much there. Right now, the score is favorable for the Dodgers there. But, again, youth can do some funny things there. And Atlanta has done some funny things all season long. And I did not expect 
just as many of the general public did not expect Atlanta uh, to get so good so quick. Um, so, you know, kind of hold your horses on that. Now, the Boston-New uh, York series, that's a toss-up in, as far as I'm concerned there. Uh, you looked at Price the other day, and he wow. just looked completely awful, although <clears throat> he's not one of my favorable people here. No, you don't like him much. <laughs> I, no, I don't. I mean, really, I don't. <laughs> you know, I, I tell you that much right now. There, uh, When I first met him, he was seemed to be a likable guy, but as the time went on when he was with the Tigers, per se, there, he things got uglier and uglier here. And so, yeah. Oh, and I just, you know, he has to, and I'm talking about Price, for instance, that Price is going to have to kind of a lot more, be a lot more humble than what he is there and, and be a lot more stricter in what, in what he does and how he does it during the season there. He has a very good offensive team behind him in Boston there. He has to do a better job of supporting his team by uh, doing some uh, stellar pitching there, and he has not done that. Uh, a lot of the games that he has won is because Boston scored very high and uh, he was been able to get out of there. Bullpen comes in, cleans up the mess and whatever, and got a victory. So this is the playoffs now. You don't get but one or two chances there. And uh, I know Price is hoping he get another chance if he's able to. But again, uh, New York is nothing to play with. They uh, well, it's just as savvy when it comes down to hitting the baseball. And they're in Yankee Stadium tonight, so it's going to get funky. In the in in the old uh, uh, Bronx, okay, tonight here. Yes, it will indeed, Butch. Uh, let's uh, end our segment on the WWE Down Under, the Super Showdown, which I know you had a chance to uh, witness, uh, not live, unfortunately. You weren't down in Australia, but you had a chance to uh, watch a good portion of that, Butch. I did not have a chance to watch it, but the big match, at least the main event, Triple H, along with Shawn Michaels defeating The Undertaker, and Kane, along with some other things that you talked about on your shows over the weekend, Butch on Sports. Uh, Butch, give our listeners, we got some wrestling fans in the, uh, in the house or listening at least, well, what, what are your thoughts on Super Showdown Down Under? I thought, well, I'll, give, I'll, I'll give it a B, okay? It was very, you know, some of the matches that you expected uh, some favorability to go on in there, like the Iconics per se there. Went in a match, I, you know. I thought that's, you know, that was kind of wacky there. Okay, you know, uh, the their competitors, which was Oscar and um, and oh boy, I can't think of the other young lady's name in the in the, in the ring there. Glow the glow lady, as I call her there. Uh, that 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 you know, I didn't get off on that there too much at all there. I thought a lot more favorability in that match could have went been a lot more stronger. But all the other matches, indeed, were kind of very much so uh, goodies there. Uh, the best match to me was AJ Styles and um, and Samoa Joe. That was, um, I mean, that was a beatdown. <laughs> with a great storyline with that whole match, too. Oh, man, that was a good one there. That was a, that, to me, that was the best match on, on the card there. Although the Shield. Yeah. And, and uh, they played a very good uh, role into that. I mean, we're talking about just uh, uh, rear end kickings there. That was a good match to watch as far as just people getting dumped and drugged around and uh, kicked around. Uh, that was a great match. But uh, the Undertaker match and also the Triple A match, that uh, that was a good match. But again, uh, with Triple H winning the match, but again, the Undertaker not taking that too serious at all. Still went up there and cleaned the place on up there. And him and his brother walk into the sunset here. Yeah. Why Triple H, although the winner, and also John Michaels getting thrown upside a, a table and breaking down a, the table and whatnot. That was a match that was, you know, it, it, it kept you intrigued indeed. It kept you going there. And I, you know, I watched it. I watched that uh, match twice there. And, uh, it gets better and better as you, if you ever get to you get a chance to take a look at that match. It was it was pretty good indeed there. Uh, it, I, I kind of wonder how Raw is going to be tonight because, again, they're coming back to the United States to do some things. How efficient some of these wrestlers are going to be. That's a lot of jet lag. 
Oh, a lot of jet lag and a lot of other things that we don't care to talk about. <laughs> but we'll see what happens tonight on on national television and again tomorrow on SmackDown on how they propose to kind of get some of the wrestling. I'm quite sure we're going to see some wrestlers that are uh, maybe at the bottom of the barrel do some wrestling tonight, and some some of the, uh, the grand wrestlers they have might get a little break here. Butch, a couple things before we end. Uh, SmackDown 1000, the thousandth uh, episode, I believe, is next week, if I'm not mistaken. That's going to be interesting. Some rumors as far as who may be coming back. And I think you talked about it on your show, but uh, one of my favorite moments from last week's Raw, We talk about you talked about Seattle getting a hockey team. Well, they were at Seattle. And one of my favorites right now, of course, is uh, Elias. I mean, he is absolutely fantastic on the mic. And being paired up with Kevin Owens, I think, is even better on the mic. These are two of my favorite guys. And Elias is very famous for uh, trash-talking the crowd. And when he made a comment about good basketball teams leaving or not coming back to Seattle, i got to say, Butch, I have not heard sustained booing in the WWE like that. I'm going to be talking more than Roman Reigns there a couple years ago at the WrestleMania that was some serious crowd heat. Wasn't that fantastic? Yeah, I have not seen the crowd so enthusiastic on booing. Uh, the last enthusiastic uh, particular one when I witnessed in person is when, uh, um, uh, let me see, uh, uh, Shane McMahon came to Detroit and right. scared the heck out of everybody. I mean, that went on for 20 minutes of sustained cheering and whatnot. And I think uh, – uh, his uh, his father and also his sister, who was in the ring at the time all this happened, was in tears because they didn't know that that was that enthusiastic there. But again, Seattle is a, where, a place where uh, I lived in Portland for a great many years there. They are very, 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 you know, the most laid back crowds in the world and, and very favorable when it comes down to the you respected their, their 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 type of living there, but when you say something bad about them, everyone, I don't care, they're Republican, Democrat, Independent, <laughs> uh, shoes or whatever it may be, they all will jump you, okay? And you know, and and they'll t- and they'll help you get on the plane to get out of town by sundown here. They they did not like that. I, I really caught it on, and and I sat up there. And last week, and I laughed. I laughed so hard because that's the way Seattle is, and that's the way uh, Portland is. And as far as their crowd, when you sit up there and talk bad about those particular type of country, which is the most beautiful parts of the, of this country, there, you 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 are not going to get away with much there. I I quietly enjoyed it. I figured you would, Butch, and I did as well. That's going to do it for Hour 1 of the game. Uh, You can find Butch Davis and his show, Butch on Sports, as I mentioned, on the podcast page. Simply Butch 2, that's too.podomatic.com. You can also find Butch on Sports on Facebook and on the podcast page of this show and the webpage of this show, thegamesportshow.podbean.com and or thegamesportshow.com. Butch, uh, stand by, hang around for a couple minutes. We'll uh, have the round table with yourself, myself, and EJ Russell coming up, so uh, hang tight for a minute, my friend. Okay. All right, that's going to do it for Hour 1. We'll be back with more of the game here on Eagle 95.1. It's time to play the game. Time to play the game! <laughs> Welcome back to the game on Eagle 95.1 online at thegamesportshow.com, thegamesportshow.podbean.com, or go to YouTube, look up the Scott Nason channel. Scott Nason broadcasting from the studios on Ashman Street. Eagle 95.1 WUPN in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Our usual host, the Wicked Sister, is closed tonight 
for a fundraiser for Dancing with the Stars, all in support of the hospice of the Eastern Upper Peninsula. We'll be back there on Monday, October 22nd. I will be out of town next week, so we won't have the game next week, but we'll be back and hopefully better than ever. We're joined once again by Butch Davis from Butch on Sports for Hour 2, our roundtable, and joining us for the first time tonight, the we like to call Cleveland sports enthusiast from Escanaba, Michigan, E.J. Russell, who joins us every week to talk about the world of sports. E.J., happy Canadian Thanksgiving, happy Columbus Day, and happy you're joining us tonight on the game. Well, we were kind of joking with this right before we went on air, but, you know, we all got a lot to be thankful for. You guys know what I'm thankful for uh, on this Monday after a Sunday, uh, to give a little hint there. But happy to be on the show, happy to be with you and Butch, and let's do this. Let's do this indeed. Uh, EJ, and we're going to give you first topic here on the roundtable. Butch, I'll give you first crack at EJ's topic. So, EJ Russell, what would you like to bring up on tonight's roundtable, sir? Well, you know, I was actually super, super excited for this to be my topic today. Uh, And too bad uh, Mr. Electric Avenue isn't here for this. But I want to talk a little hockey. After the first, you know, group of games here, uh, what's your take on on a few teams that that may or may not have been favorites? Uh, You know, I watched the Capitals on Banner Night. Uh, I watched the Red Wings play the Blue Jackets the other night. And I did catch some of the Toronto Maple Leafs game. Uh, so I guess my my question to the roundtable here is, uh, what do you guys think of the start of the NHL season? Uh, who has come out and looked better at the beginning than you may have thought if you're watching? Uh, but just the general status in the NHL. Butch, uh, you and I talked about the Red Wings in the previous segment. Uh, any other NHL that's got your attention <laughs> over the first week? Mm-mm. Well- I'll, I'll be honest with you, I didn't look at a lot of this week here. I, I did check a little bit of the Capitals game on Wednesday night there uh, when they uh, got in front of their crowd to uh, hoist up the pennant or whatever they do right in the uh, the midst of their uh, arena to show that they're world champions in hockey. <clears throat> a lot of we arguing about that there. But, no, I didn't get a lot of chances to check a lot of teams on out and see the results of them per se there. I was more or less into the Red Wing game from beginning to end. And, again, I was very impressed how those young kids came out there and skated. And uh, some things that I've discussed throughout the offseason in in regards to what they would need to do to improve themselves. So, you know, one of the most important parts that I said was the defense would have to get better, not only in uh, doing things to protect their goaltender, but being a lot faster and a lot physical. And I saw both of that in that particular game there, and I, it was very refreshing to see. As uh, far as the rest of the league in, in particular there, I haven't got a lot of bend and stretch there. Uh, sorry to say, of uh, what every, all the other teams were doing, I did see uh, the Red Wings last night uh, for a, a, a little period of time, and that wasn't really as what I saw the first night there, you know, where I can say, you know, job well done, uh, they're improving there. But again, uh, the season very early, I'd say maybe in two or three, maybe a month, then we'll get a better gauge of who, who's in and who's out. Yeah, Butch, I kind of go along the lines of you. I haven't had a chance to see too much of the NHL so far, obviously, Focusing on the Wings and Leafs, uh, Toronto last night with a 7-6 to win in Chicago. You had a couple interesting goal celebrations there. Uh, Austin Matthews uh, kind of mocked the Chicago bench, and then uh, Patrick Kane scored and did the same kind of mock. And so it was, a, it was a lot of fun. The Leafs off to a good start. Uh, this early, a lot of teams have still only played one game. You look at Tampa and Florida, they've only played one game. New Jersey has only played one game. Uh, Edmonton has only played one game looking at the early standings and again it's very early we're worried about the rangers at 0-3 and they're giving up a lot of goals they lost last night to carolina eight and five watch out for that carolina team they may be one of the more surprise teams in the nhl but the rangers right now i'm a little worried about them starting off the season at 0-3 but again, it's it's very early. I mean, you have the usual cast of characters up there. Washington looked very strong in their opening game against Boston. You have New Jersey. They started off pretty well at 1-0. Chicago's 2-0-1. They did lose to Toronto last night in overtime. Dallas and my team to watch out for. I really think Colorado 
is looking to be a pretty tough contender in the West right now. You can't count out Winnipeg and, and you know, San Jose, Anaheim. San Jose off to a little bit of a slow start at 1-2 and two along with Vegas. So early days in the NHL, EJ, I know Dave would have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots to say about the NHL. So we're probably going to keep it a little briefer than if Mr. Electric Avenue was here. I'll throw the question back to you, sir. What do you think about the first week of the NHL? You know what? I, I think that despite the Washington Capitals, overtime loss in their second game. Boy, did I think that they came out strong uh, on batter night as they unveiled their Stanley Cup championship banner uh, in what was, I thought, a longer-than-necessary ceremony. I thought it was a bit long. Uh, Mr. Leonis's words, though, uh, very, very well thought through. I uh, really wanted to give credit to the fans, so I thought the Washington Capitals did a great, great job. But coming into that game, scoring 24 to 20, what was it, 24, 26 seconds into that game uh, with a goal, uh, the Washington Capitals came back into this league with some noise. And they came out banging. They looked and fantastic. They dominated that game. Alex Ovechkin having a power play goal as well. Uh, you know, scoring his traditional one timer from the top of the uh, off weak side circle. Uh, really nice play. Very uh, great shot from him. But Alex Ovechkin in that first game really did look like the, the world-class player that he needs to be in order for that team to be successful. And no Stanley Cup hangover, which can be very, very difficult uh, for some teams to get over, a championship hangover, regardless of sport. Uh, but really, I was paying very close attention to the Toronto Maple Leafs. And i got to say this because Dave's not here. Uh, Tavares looks like he is the answer right now. Putting up a hat trick last night, scored a goal in their first game back. Uh, for the Maple Leafs this year, uh, first game uh, with the team in regular season. And they, they look the part. They, they're they playing the part. Tavares is being, in the first two games, exactly what he wanted him to be. If you would have told me Tavares had four goals in his first two games, uh, I think many people would have thought it would take him more time to settle into that role. Uh, but the NHL is exciting. It is back. Uh, we got an 82-game schedule pretty much still right in front of us here that's going to go off without a hitch. Um, but I think Edmonton coming in, you know, yeah, they've only played one game. Uh, they're losing. Uh, they lost that game. Uh, they need to come back and win in their next appearance. Um, but a couple, I mean, standings aren't important right now. Uh, Detroit, I think they did a nice job, uh, giving some credit to Henrik Zetterberg and what was I thought uh, a very appropriate ceremony. I think that they did a good job there. Uh, but just excited that the NHL's back. Uh, I am, because of our co-host Dave here, uh, very interested to see how things play out with the Tavares experiment in Toronto. But so far, things are looking good for the blue and the white, uh, and Toronto's my team to watch this year. Let's continue the roundtable. Gentlemen, Butch, we'll go to you as far as what topic you would like to talk about on tonight's roundtable, sir. Uh, we'll kind of be light and, and lovely. Let's talk about the city of Cleveland. <laughs> I figured it, it, it should be. Thanks, buddy. Then you're welcome. Uh, uh, today was one of the headlines that I saw on the news today. It's Columbus, Ohio. Don't celebrate Columbus Day like everybody do in the United States, which I don't think nobody really celebrates Columbus Day like they should anymore. The only people who really benefit from that is the United States government there and the banks there, which are all closed down to the ground here. However, let's say some nice things. The Cleveland Browns look absolutely fantastic. I saw that game in 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 this uh, not in this entirety, but the, at the end of it, and that was some, some uh, fantastic. I was glad to see that win. Uh, they deserve that win. They grinded on out. They you guys got an exciting team in Cleveland this year. That you know, I'm not going to say that they're going to uh, just blow the the dens out of everybody there, but they're going to be somebody. That uh, a team that really gives them competition, and the Cleveland Indians. Uh, I expect it better from them there for them to get swept under the table and kicked to the to the curve. I didn't expect all of that per se there. So I uh, want to get some comments there on those particular subjects, indeed. There, EJ, I'll go first because I'm sure I'm going to be a little briefer than you will be on this topic, and and I agree with Bush. Most likely. Uh, going back to the Browns game. Yesterday, I watch NFL Red Zone, so it bounces around to a lot of games. Well, of course, towards the end of that game, they were there, and you know, you see how that game developed. And Cleveland Browns definitely aren't getting any benefits of any calls this season. I think that's pretty, uh, pretty 
pretty forward, pretty obvious if you watch any of the games. They are they are getting some bad calls against them. Luckily for them, it didn't cost them yesterday. That defense has been very impressive after a, a rough game out in Oakland. And Baker Mayfield, again, just kind of gutting it out, not putting up the, the flashiest numbers, but when they need him to make the throw or, or not to make a mistake, he seems to be doing a great job. It's really been nice to see his development over the last three games, and it was nice to see a kicker, Greg Joseph, although the kick wasn't the prettiest you would see. Kickers were having all sorts of issues yesterday, but a couple of them did pretty good, including Grand Gano at a 63-yard game-winning field goal for Cleveland. So very happy to see Cleveland win that game. First win on a Sunday and what, 600-some-odd games, I believe. And you look at that NFC North division, Cincinnati, they looked like they were going to lose, but they gutted it out and beat Miami. They're 4-1. and one. You have Baltimore now at 3-2, and two, and Pittsburgh and Cleveland both 2-2-1. Two, two and one. Really, I think it's anybody's division right now. This is probably going to be the most intriguing division in all of football this year. The NFC East might be because of the teams aren't as good, but the NFC or the AFC North very interesting. And you look at Cleveland's schedule. I mean, they got some winnable games coming up. I think they play the Chargers, which oh, that's not a winnable game, maybe. But the way they're playing, they could easily be five and zero as far as. The, the the lack of luck they've had in some of these games. So very nice to see the Cleveland Browns do well. Good for the city of Cleveland. Good for the fans. I agree with Butch. The Indians, I was kind of pumping them up over the last couple weeks on the broadcast, figuring that they really were going to do a little bit more. Now, I wasn't 100% sure they are going to knock off Houston, but I did not expect them to get swept. I did not expect them to lose big today. But you got to give credit to that Houston team looking to be the first repeat champion in Major League Baseball since the year 2000, if you can believe that, the New York Yankees, back when they had that stretch of uh, victories for the World Series title. So, yeah, very very disappointed with the Cleveland Indians. It could be the fact that they didn't play really any meaningful, close, tough games all year because of the division they were in. They pretty much had, had it going on where Houston, they had a, a bit of a battle. To win their division, obviously Boston and the Yankees have been battling. So maybe it was a case of just not playing important baseball, or maybe it was the case that Houston just a darn good baseball team, and they're going to be tough for Boston or New York. So, hey, mixed bag for Cleveland. I think the Browns fans are happy, the Indians fans maybe disappointed, but that's a football town, as EJ will tell you, and I think the Browns winning might be a little more on the pecking order as far as importance than the Indians losing. But we have a gentleman from the Ohio area that will give us more on his take. So, E.J. Russell, the floor is yours, sir. I'll tell you what. It sure feels more important that the Browns won, but we need to remember that the Indians getting swept in the playoffs is nothing that, that we expected. This is a team that recently contended for a World Series title, including taking uh, the Chicago Cubs to seven games and extra innings. Uh, until an unfortunate moment in extra innings where the Indians end up losing that game. Um, but the Indians should have gotten swept. Uh, I think we all expect them to be more competitive. Uh, really, the bats just didn't show up. Frankie Ramirez had a home run, in, I believe it was game two. Um, but Jose Ramirez really wasn't swinging the bat. You could feel that he wasn't swinging the bat with the kind of confidence that he normally does. And that was something that was a bit off. Uh, and that threw the Indians out of whack. Uh, Cleveland Browns, though, really the story of that team this year as far as the successes that they're having in games and winning games um, is that defense. They're, they're absolutely fantastic. They're the key to winning right now. Uh, I think easily the most important fact to bring up is that Denzel Ward, our rookie, okay, has three interceptions uh, in his career right now, and that's in five games. also has a forced fumble. Uh, 25 combined tackles has really shown up and been the kind of player that we've wanted him to be as far as a rookie goes. Uh, but the defense shown up Baker Mayfield looking very, very comfortable at no point uh, during the game as I was watching. And it was a slow play paced game. Uh, one that as a player, you easily could have lost focus in that game with, with the way that it was getting slugged out. Uh, Baker Mayfield looked confident, and comfortable every, every time you touch the football, even after making mistakes. In the fourth quarter and in that overtime period, as I was watching it move the team down the quarterback, uh, down the field, excuse me, uh, Baker Mayfield was making confident throws into middle, into traffic, uh, and 
connecting. Uh, had a good completion percentage throughout the game. Uh, less his interception, though, I thought he played phenomenal. Uh, so Baker Mayfield in that defense, uh, I mean, uh, Carlos Hyde, Jarvis Landry, you can continue to name those guys. There are so many in- integral pieces on this team that without one of them, I think the wheels fall off. Um, but the Browns playing with confidence in that defense and Baker Mayfield injecting the energy that he has has been the key to the Browns being successful. Uh, so go Browns. Happy to see him get another win. It was arguably the worst game winning field goal I've ever seen, barely making it over the bar. But Browns get the W uh, in a game that most people pick Baltimore to win. Let's continue the pro football talk, gentlemen. And uh, week six of the NFL had its usual unpredictability, uh, close games, some blowouts. And, well, one thing is certain. Two favorites right now in the NFL after, you know, five games have to be the Los Angeles Rams and the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, The Rams win a close one in Seattle, tough place to play yesterday, and the Chiefs take care of what was the best-ranked defense in the NFL. Uh, Butch, I'll go to you first. Uh, 5-0 Rams, 5-0 Chiefs. Are we looking at a Super Bowl matchup, or what are some of the other things and notes that you saw in week uh, six, I believe, of the NFL, or is it five? I, I, I get confused, but what happened yesterday in the National Football League? Mm, I think it's week five, I do believe, here, yeah, but, you know, give or take, you know. It's Correct. Week. My math's bad. <laughs> week five. <laughs> oh, boy. I, I like the Chiefs last, yesterday because, you know what, uh, although they really built up uh, Mahomes as, a, as, you know, the rapid-fire quarterback, per se. And, you know, really and truly, it was very intriguing to me because all the quarterbacks who were drafted won yesterday there, every last one of them there. Yeah. So you can put to bed uh, a young quarterback got to go through their lumps, what it may be. None of them went through those lumps uh, Sunday. They all won. He rose some one there. And now, uh, I kind of picked them to lose, and uh, fool me, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> man, it ain't on my face here, and I'm still wiping it off, uh, you know, but the, the, the Chiefs, they didn't throw a touchdown pass, and still got over and won the game with a lot of talent out there, uh, a lot of ways to beat you besides just throwing the ball, and that was very impressed of that. The really part I was impressed with the Chiefs was their defense. Their defense was, they showed up, and they showed uh, the Jaguars that, you know, we will not be undersold by any means necessary here. But they really took care of that team. They took care of that team uh, big time here. The Rams, on that other hand, there, I kind of looked at that game going up and down, up and down. That was a great up and down game. That that was a game to watch it. You like to hit, see a lot of scoring and a lot of intrigue and whatnot. And the Rams come back and, and, and winning that game um, was a very impressive indeed. Uh, again, I, I'm not going to go as far as to say that that might be the Super Bowl uh, uh, upcoming there. But again, those particular two teams you just mentioned, Scott, uh, got a lot of upside with them right now. There, and they're, they're not to be moved at all. On the other on the other side of the fence, Pittsburgh came in and uh, and and did a number. They showed that they're not out of this by any means necessary. There, they're going to do some some damage, and they're going to try to get in those playoffs. Hook a high water. Um, the Lions again, uh, thanking uh, Crosby as he shot himself in the foot several times in the game at Ford Field because just look at this, you know he misses four field goals and an extra point. Just look at if those points were made and those field goals were made, what would have been the outcome of the game there? Not saying that the Lions would not have did some other things, but again, it showed me also that the Lions have to do a better job of wiping teams out of the out of out, out of the out of the world here when it comes down to uh, playing every week in the NFL. Um, teams are, are better than what you say they are. Even when, especially when they play the Lions, okay, because the Lions get so far so tough. And again, we see Golden take out there being a child again. Hopefully, if this guy is a great football player, if he can get his maturity in check, 
and that spread on. Although this week I understand that the coach got a, got in touch with him on those touchdowns that he scored, and that if he ever did that ever again, a further action will be taken on him here. Uh, that did stop, but again, throughout the the last portion of the game, the clowning came came back into play. So I don't know, you know. I'm impressed with the Rams. I am impressed with the Chiefs. I'm just gonna kind of like wait to this kind of uh, this this snowball effect of the NFL kind of grow here. We're gonna see some surprises here. I'm I'm quite sure. That's definitely a fun league to watch. Uh, Butch, we lost EJ real quick. I'm gonna try to get him back on the uh, on the horn, so to speak. We may have to go to a break. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's do this. Let's take a quick break, and we'll be back with our last portion of the game here on Eagle. Get Wicked Catering from the crew at the Wicked Sister. We like to think of ourselves as foodies. While our favorite foods are paired with a beer tasting at the Wicked Sister, you can now have the same creative menu for your next catered business luncheon, family get-together, wedding, or holiday party. Our white truffle risotto appeals to your gluten-free and vegetarian guests. Add sautéed shrimp or freshly grilled chicken for a pop of protein. Or let us build you a custom menu to suit your needs. From plated events of 15 to buffets for 200, the Wicked Sister will cater your event with tapas, snacks, craveables, or a full sit-down dinner. The Wicked Sister, where you'll be treated like family, whether you like it or not. Welcome back to the game on Eagle 95.1 and online at thegamesportshow.com, thegamesportshow.podbean.com, or on YouTube, just look up the Scott Nason channel. We're back with our roundtable, Butch Davis from Butch on Sports and E.J. Russell. And E.J., we got you back on the line, and our topic was pro football. Uh, Butch just gave us his uh, thoughts on week five of the NFL and the two undefeated teams, the Kansas City Chiefs and the Los Angeles Rams. Uh, we talked a lot about the Browns and the Lions already. EJ, uh, your thoughts on those teams and some of the other doings in the National Football League? I, I think to me, uh, the story of Week Five is Pittsburgh Steelers getting back on track, running the football well. Antonio Brown getting over 100 yards total uh, and two touchdowns, um, making plays for the Pittsburgh Steelers again. I think that is something. Uh, that people need to stay on lookout for because I still think that the Pittsburgh Steelers are the class of the AFC North, and, and people need to remember that, uh, however good they are. Uh, I think the Kansas City Chiefs are, are just that good of a football team this year. I think they're a complete football team, a good, solid defense, uh, what looks to be uh, one of the most powerful offenses in NFL outside of maybe the Los Angeles Rams, who are another great football team and only got better this year. Uh, on the defensive side of the football. Uh, as long as those two teams continue to uh, play the way they are, I think they're the favorites uh, to meet up in the playoffs. And Cleveland Browns, I mean, I, I really think that they're, to me, still the, the story of the year. Yeah, I'll uh, answer my own topic, gentlemen. And I like what Butch said about all the rookie quarterbacks yesterday winning. Mayfield in Cleveland. How about Sam Darnold? In New York, uh, didn't have to throw a lot, but when he did, he made some long passes. Isaiah Crowell goes off for, I think, 200 yards as the Jets beat Denver. Boy, Denver did not look good. Buffalo and uh, Josh Allen winning at home by the score of 13-12. to And how about Arizona getting their first win there? Uh, Rosen, Josh Rosen winning at San Francisco by the score of 28-18. to Looking at some of the other games you know, of note, uh, that Carolina game we talked about, Graham Gano hitting the 63-yard field goal. Cincinnati improving to 4-1. and one. They're down 17 nothing to Miami. And it was really the defense that uh, caused the turnaround there as Cincinnati scores two defensive special teams touchdown. You guys both mentioned Pittsburgh over Atlanta. The L.A. Chargers quietly uh, moving up to 3-2 and two as they dismantled Oakland. Doesn't look like the John Gruden thing's working out too well. 
for the Raiders. Uh, Philadelphia losing another game. This one at home to Minnesota by the score of 23-21. to And then last night's game, uh, Houston defeats Dallas by the score of 19-16. to So I think surprise teams. I don't think many people had Cincinnati at 4-1. and I don't think a whole lot of people had Philadelphia at 2-3, and three, just not looking very good. But, like Butch said, and, well, every week we see in the NFL, sometimes you just have to wait and see what happens next week. Cause just when you think you got it figured out, things change quickly in the NFL. Uh, gentlemen, we have time for one, maybe two more topics. So, EJ, I'll go back to you. Uh, any other topics you would like to bring up to tonight's roundtable? Uh, Major League playoffs are going on. The tribe getting swept today. Uh, Atlanta battling it out with the Dodgers. I don't know if that game's gone final yet. Uh, I know that it, the Dodgers were winning at the time that I turned off the game. Um, but the Major League Baseball playoffs are going on. The hunt for October is ongoing. Uh, who going into this divisional series uh, as the game stand tonight? Which team do you think is is probably the best looking team? And, and what do you think the World Series matchup is going to look like? Which we talked a little bit about this in our segment earlier. Uh, right now, it's the end of the seventh inning in Atlanta. The Dodgers are up six to two over the Braves. Uh, winner takes on Milwaukee. Houston will take on the winner of Boston. The Yankees. Game three tonight in New York, tied at one. What's your thoughts on EJ's topic? Best team, and who do you think right now is going to be your World Series? <laughs> we don't want to call that one there because then we'll we'll still. I'll, I have wiped enough egg off my face here. Uh, <laughs> really, yeah. uh, Milwaukee looks very good. Milwaukee looks strong. They look, oh boy, they look like uh, they got it all figured out. I'm not going to say too much about Milwaukee, but right now, that's to me, in the National League right now, the way things are going in Atlanta right now, as we went on the air on the live broadcast there um, for, the, for the game, uh, Machado had hit a three uh, a three run homer, and and that just turned every doggone thing around, just upside down there. Uh, Atlanta is a team that you know, as we know, as some young kids, some young studs, that you can't really wipe out the picture there. Uh, there, speaking of pitching, there, uh, we don't know who got the advantage in that there between the Dodgers and Atlanta there. So uh, again, if the Dodgers win today. That's that 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 game is over and done with here, and uh, they can all pack their bags and get ready to go to Dodger Stadium or whoever. No, it'll be Milwaukee. I do believe will have the better record there. Um, then maybe go to Milwaukee to play there. But again, looking at that, uh, National League is hard to figure out. The American League per se there is either New York or Boston. Um, not giving any too much stock to what I saw in Houston. Houston seemed like they got all the buttons of pushing at the right direction at the right time. They uh, they wasn't all that that uh, gunslinger as they were uh, last year. Although they did win a hundred games, uh, Houston it looks like right now that's going to be the team to beat in the American League, regardless of who shows up, Boston or New York. Now, if Boston and New York are doing their hitting as they have done in the past. Okay, and in this playoff particular series, as they're doing, that might be a lot tougher series than I can imagine to put Houston ahead in the catbird seat there. But again, it's always a wait and see uh, uh, particular that uh, we have to look at, and uh, it's it, it's going to be it's going to be tough indeed. And we'll know in a couple of days, if not tonight, what what's going to happen. Yeah, Butch, uh, I'll pick up from there. Uh, Milwaukee would have home field in the National League Championship Series uh, by way of having uh, four more wins in the regular season over the L.A. Dodgers, as you mentioned. And I guess I'm, I'm pulling for Milwaukee, so maybe that's why I think that they're going to win. It would be a nice story, a team that hasn't won a World Series, I believe, since 1982. Robin Yount and the Brew Crew back in the day, a couple years before the Tigers won in 84, a former American League Central team along with um, you know Toronto and the two that were in the Central uh, back when watching baseball a little more on a regular basis. So I would like to see Milwaukee. I think the Dodgers get it done tonight, but they're a team that traditionally underachieves. Now, they did make it to the World Series last year, but 
It's a team that seems to get to this point and then sometimes can't figure it out. So I like Milwaukee in the National League. American League, you know, maybe Boston and New York play five games. Maybe they beat each other up. And Houston just kind of sitting there just waiting. You have the pitching matchups are going to be set early for them. And, you know, but you look at Boston, if they get through, they're going to have to pitch David Price a couple times. And, well, you know what he does in the postseason? <laughs> he doesn't do anything. <laughs> that guy is absolutely bad, pathetic, I guess you could say, in the postseason. He just cannot get the job done. And it's tough to watch as a Tiger fan seeing all these players playing Ian Kinsler, J.D. Martinez, um, you know, Justin Verlander, and you think of all the players that could have been on the Tigers and where they would be. But what, we don't play what ifs. We play what is going on right now, and I still think Boston just has a little much for New York to win, but who knows? We'll know more in a few days, so if I had to say right now who I like in the World Series, give me Houston, give me Milwaukee. I'm not going to say who wins that. Let's just see how much egg I'm going to be wiping off of my face in a week or two, or I should say two weeks, when I think we'll be close to the World Series here on the game. EJ Russell, your thoughts on your topic, sir? Well, I think uh, the the team that really has impressed me in this playoff so far has been the Milwaukee Brewers. And I agree with you, Scott, that they are my favorite to come out of the NL. Reason being, those fans are showing up, and they have incredible energy throughout the entire game. They've been pulling for that team. They're supporting that team. Uh, that team and the town are going together through this. Uh, and I really do think that this is the year that the Brewers – finally pull through and make it to a World Series. Um, I think I, I kind of agree along with your line, Scott. Uh, I think the Yankees and the Red Sox might beat each other up a little bit. Um, as far as energy goes, uh, I don't think their skill sets are going to be diminished at all, but I think they're going to spend a lot of energy on this series. Only the fourth time that the Yankees and Red Sox have been up in the playoffs, uh, and this is huge. This is for the right to go in the League Championship Series. This is a big series for uh, rival teams. I think that the Yankees do come out there. I think if John Carlos Stanton um, starts to produce a little bit more in these playoffs, that the Yankees do become the best team in the American League. Uh, and I think that their bats are too strong uh, for the Houston Astros, and that's why I think the Yankees are going to come out of the American League. I think the Houston Astros have the best starting rotation uh, out of any team in the American League playoff side of, of things right now. Um but I don't think Bergman is going to be the name that's going to continue to carry them throughout these playoffs. Uh, and he's so far has, has been the guy for them as far as seeing the baseball goes. I just don't see that being uh, a formula for success for them going forward. Uh, having said that, uh, again, we'll go Yankees Brewers. And I just think that the Yankees bats and power are going to be too much for the Brewers. I think the Yankees will, if, if it is Yankees Brewers, I think the Yankees will take that in five games. Gentlemen, we have time for one more topic. Uh, Butch, do you have any other topics you want to bring up to tonight's roundtable? Yeah, why not? Here? Yeah. Tonight, uh, if you watch the football game, per se, there, you might see a new record being brought into play there. Drew Brees uh, will be going for a passing record there. How important is that with all the uh, the quarterbacks now in the future and in, in, in the present and also in the past, how important is that particular? And I know the NFL has changed a heck of a lot when it comes down to throwing the ball versus running. But how important is that particular record that Drew Brees, uh, you know, per se, that uh, may be set tonight? And probably nine times out of ten will be set tonight. Yeah, it should be, Butch. Uh, Drew Brees at home on a Monday night. Uh, you can count him for a couple hundred yards, you would think, against a Washington team. But I think it's very important as far as, obviously, Hall of Fame material. Drew Brees is going to be in the Hall of Fame. There's no question about that. And with the NFL becoming a much more passing league, I mean, you look at uh, you know one of the older players that had one of the passing records at one time, Dan Marino. The league was a lot different when Dan mm-hmm. Marino and Dan Fouts and Joe Montana were playing, and, and they did put up some big yardage, but now you're going to see that record probably broken several times, but you need to have a lot of longevity if you're going to break that record. Brett Favre, Peyton Manning, Drew Brees, I mean, these are guys, these are guys, rather, that did not miss a lot of time, at least uh, Favre and Brees, especially just going out and playing 
week in and week out. And, and Drew Brees coming out of the Big Ten in Purdue, I don't know if when he was drafted you would have said this is going to be the guy that passes for the most yards in the NFL. And he does have a Super Bowl as well, so that always helps. I mean, you can have the, the best passing stats in the world, but if you haven't won anything, and, and, and there are uh, several players in the NFL that can say this, then Dan really, Marino. really those stats are just on paper where you know you look at drew Brees, he's won a super bowl and he's going to set the record and he's going to be known as one of the best quarterbacks of all time but you're going to put him definitely along the likes of joe montana tom brady and such because he has the numbers to back it up ej your thoughts i think that drew Brees is is such a fitting guy to be uh, after he throws for at least 100, 201 yards today, he will be the all-time leader. Um, I think what a humble guy, what a great guy, uh, what a guy to deserve that honor. Uh, Drew Brees, just a, a class act throughout his entire career. The things he's done for that community in New Orleans, uh, even the time he spent in San Diego, he was he was good to that franchise, uh, but really has grown into himself in New Orleans, bringing that town on a Super Bowl title. Um, in their time of need after Hurricane Katrina uh, occurred down there. Drew Brees is, in my opinion, the most underrated quarterback of all time. Undersized guy, uh, has had to move from team to team because they thought he was done, uh, and they and they dump him off, move him to the New Orleans Saints, a place where people's careers go uh, used to go to die. The New Orleans Saints never having a ton of success um, in their time in the league. Drew Brees, what a guy. I mean, he really does deserve the record. If you haven't seen his work off the football field, uh, I encourage you to look it up, get into it, because this is a guy that doesn't just uh, walk the walk or talk the talk. He is the talk. He is the walk. Uh, and he's a guy that everyone should look up to. So definitely a guy that's deserving. I don't think... He necessarily cares that he gets the record, uh, but I think absolutely 100% beyond deserving of such an accolade. Very well said, EJ. Uh, Butch Davis, your thoughts on your topic before we get to our thumbs up and thumbs down this week? Well, I think you guys had some great uh, comments in in regards to Drew Brees there. This is a guy, uh, I'm looking at uh, his record book and what it may be, uh, was not all that uh, thought about in high school there. As many... uh, a football players uh, who's made in the NFL so has not been always thought of as this big bad boogie bear to come out there and, and shake the ground on running there. This is a guy who was relegated to the B team <laughs> and and worked his way up. I enjoyed him in San Diego uh, tremendously there. He always had that what you call that fighting spirit, and he gave San Diego's team a run for their money when when he was out there playing. He was never out of a game. He changed the culture when he went to New Orleans there. For New Orleans, as we know, was always that losing team that really just couldn't get over the hump. Had some great players, per se, but again, just couldn't get over the hump. Uh, Drew Brees changed all of that there with some of his, his fighting spirit. And I can never forget when, uh, <clears throat> when the hurricane came and uh, New Orleans came out that particular night uh, just uh, well in the way, just beating the brains out of everybody and, and that they called on and end up winning their uh, a world's uh, championship. Uh, the only one that they ever won, but at least, you know, winning one versus the Lions not winning the Super Bowl at all, that means a whole heck of a lot. But he's done a whole heck of a lot for that uh, for that New Orleans team there. And you can't do nothing. And whenever I have met him, to do an interview or to get words of wisdom or whatever it may be on what was going on. He's always been very humble indeed in, in treating the, the media at, at, at best, you know, to give them the answers they need, not being fresh, not taking this uh, game where you owe him something or whatever it may be. You know, for the person that he is and, uh, and he's gone through, uh, per se, in, the, in, in this league there, uh, it would be fitting for him to get uh, break the record. We're not going to talk about him as much as they talk about Peyton Manning. They may not talk about him as much as uh, Tom Brady, but he sure has going to be in the conversation 
of what he has done, not only for the National Football League, but the cities that he has played in. And and we go back to Purdue, okay? Purdue wasn't all that up to snuff either until uh, he came on the scene with Purdue, and Purdue was a, uh, a, a team to be reckoned with in the Big Ten. So, again, uh, it's more very deserving that he gets that accolade there and be the all-time passing great. Again, he may not get all the accolades and whatnot as some other quarterbacks have in the in the past, but uh, again, he's right up there. Well said, Butch. Uh, great roundtable, gentlemen. Let's get to our thumbs up and thumbs down for the week. I will start. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about it. I didn't watch it, but of course, if you watch the highlights over the Sports uh, Center and, and such this weekend, it was another UFC fight. Night, uh, UFC 7000 or something, whatever it was, UFC, and Conor McGregor taking on uh, a Russian guy, I guess we'll just call him, and there was uh, UFC 229, there we go, and there was uh, some uh, WWE-like antics after the match as uh, the winner there, uh, Mr. Khabib, jumped over the the hexagon, the pentagon, the octagon, whatever it's called, going after a few of Conor McGregor's crew, and then uh, somebody else walked in and went after McGregor. It, it was like a bad episode of Monday Night Raw, but I think it was real. Maybe it was real. Well, the person that did get the realest is Conor McGregor. In his last two matches, he's 0-2, and he's made $150 million. So the joke's on us, and thumbs down to that whole uh, debacle in the UFC. Thumbs up to, well, all of us on the game, including E.J. Russell, Butch Davis, Dave McKegg, and Katie Woolen, who couldn't be here tonight, as I had a chance to update our website, thegamesportshow.com, and we're not just putting episodes of the game including this one that we broadcast from the wicked sister dave shows from sue ontario but i put all the sports content on the podcast page including butch on sports on that page uh, my segments with paul van wagner uh, sue eagles hockey broadcast and just a lot of good sports material and, and as i was putting that together i just thought of when we started this whole venture myself and dave and then butch uh, very early on coming on board and you know having some ups and downs in the process uh, you know trying to get a good product out there something that's very unique that you don't hear really anywhere as far as what we do and you know especially on this show this is the mothership show right here the game from the wicked sister used to be uh coffee with the coach back at mcdonald's then we made the switch to the game we moved over to the wicked sister and you know we've created quite a team in my opinion and and a great show with Lots of differing opinions and lots of great sports content from a local perspective here. Uh, Sioux, Ontario, Eastern Upper Peninsula, across the state of Michigan with Butch, down in Detroit, uh, even in you know Ohio with EJ's contributions. He came on a couple years ago just by being at our show and uh, complaining about a shootout. And look where he's at right now. Yeah, you guys have done a fantastic job. Love having Katie back on our on board. Of course, Dave does a great job, and uh, just thumbs up to all of you. i got to say that every now and then, but as I had a chance to put together the web page, had a little extra time this weekend, just uh, made me a, a proud papa, if you will, although I guess what you could technically be my dad, but we'll, we'll, we'll just go from there as far, well, at least I think, but... My dad's name is Butch, but I digress. So let's move on before I get myself in trouble. Uh, E.J. Russell, your thumbs up and thumbs down for the week, sir. Uh, well, obviously, first thumbs up. Thanks to you, Scott. You're, you're the uh, the piece that makes this all happen. So we really appreciate you, uh, including all of us, and letting us be a part of the show. Uh, however, I think I will always disagree with you on shootouts. Shootouts well, are good for the game of hockey. <laughs> um but thumbs down this week, Cleveland Indians getting swept. I mean, I got to say that for my hometown. I mean, that's just that that's not what we were looking to do in the playoffs. Uh, thumbs up, though. Uh, I got to give it to Baker Mayfield uh, just because he did stand in that game, uh, which I did watch from front to back um, with, with Becca, who I did have a Cleveland in a Cleveland Brown shirt. I want that to be known. Uh, but we watched that game from front to back and. Baker Mayfield stood in that pocket with poise and confidence throughout the day uh, and and drove the team down the field in overtime to lead to a game-winning field goal. Thumbs up, Baker Mayfield. Great job. Thumbs down, Cleveland Indians. I uh, got to do better than that. Thank you, EJ. And uh, Butch Davis, your thumbs up and thumbs down, sir. 
I'm, I'm going to go along with the thumbs down for the, 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 the incredible brouhaha after the, after the match fight with McGregor and you say the rest guy here. <laughs> that was, I saw that too. Khabib Nurga, Nurmagomedov. There you uh, go. Wherever, wherever his name is here, you know. Uh, he's the winner. Yeah, right. You know, he, you ain't going to talk about his daddy no more. I tell you what here, man. <laughs> right now, he's got to be known. Uh, that's a joke. I, I'm not a huge fan of MMA and all this other good stuff there, but again, it's something that many people uh, take a liking to, so you can't put it down at, on, on that perspective there. But again, if they're doing this for publicity acts or what it may be, shame on them. And that's a joke, okay? Because they're gonna they're gonna win some public and trying to boost this dog on thing up to a no, not one. But it can tell also that it's going down in complexity and also in credibility there because it has the dog on joint is a shot up on on uh, steroids or something of that <laughs> nature and some better fighters that you can see like Jones here, you probably may not see him again until you know they clean him out. And when they clean him out, they'll probably be skinny as a dog on pencil here. I don't know what to say about that particular. But yeah, thumbs down on that joke here. Uh, good luck when trying to win some people to try to watch the next uh, MMA match here, whatever it is, a thousand and one or whatever it may be. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Sound like me, but I just don't care. Uh, you know, thumbs up. Uh, you know, uh, you just mentioned about the, the game and how that all comprised and what it may be. We got to mention one guy here who basically, you know, is an unsung hero to this whole situation here that got you and I together. The guy, gentleman, that your old former boss, Carl, okay? That's right. Uh, got it Carl Monroe. He is a, well, Carl Monroe is the... We, that, that's the person we got to drag on in when I come into town here, which I will make a huge attempt to go see him there. That guy, you know, he, with some persistence and whatnot, got us together. And uh, that's when I, I end up being on a morning show at that particular station there. And uh, I met our other uh, co-worker who was... I feel bad for him and Blacksburn there. All that <laughs> hoop line, whatever it may be. <laughs> I watched it to beginning and end, and I thought that was incredible. Only for that team to lose like they did. I mean, God. Um, boy, uh, the colleague there, uh, we, we met on that on that morning show, and he, and oh, he asked way. me about Michigan. Yeah, Paul Victor, the big time Paul. Uh, man, you know, ask me about uh, <laughs> what kind of football team do I run with, and I don't know, just some came out of me and said, not a dog on one of them. I'm from Oregon here, you know. <laughs> that just, you know, that just, you know, that 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 right there, that particular statement. I mean, it cut a rug and on that morning show, second and none, and and people were listening because they invited me back, and which was the worst move I thought I could ever make, but I. I did it anyway here, and and we end up getting this show together here, and again, we saw our rumps and the bumps and whatever it may be, and this and that, but the Wicked Sister, uh, when that came into play here, seemed like everything, uh, we took some uh, some sacrificial uh, uh, cuts with everybody doing their job, and uh, we became a success story in uh, Northeastern um, uh, Michigan portion of the Upper Peninsula there and, and 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 it's worked out for us very much so not only we get uh, a great crowd in, in upper peninsula there but we have gotten some in in the ontario section uh, we do travel in there where we do get uh a lot of wisconsin per se and a lot of green bay packer fans and i'm so sorry that do not fire do not get rid of cosby he exactly. will be you do not get rid of that man. I will be mad as I don't know what if that the Green Bay get rid of Cosby. For you'll, what? you'll never see Crosby miss kicks like that again. Never. Uh, no, never. And, yeah, and I, and then, you know what? And I, the, you know, on the edge on that particular one, let's give a a, 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 a add a boy to the Green Bay coach who put him in at that last minute and he made that field goal there. You know that that was a class act. Okay, they could have went for. It and didn't get anything or had a cut touchdown. But you know what? Putting that man on the field and, and snapping his confidence back and Rodgers coming out there, congratulating him, this team did, that shows what 
sportsmanship is all about. That was tremendous there, and I, I really like that. Those are my thumbs up for this week. Well said, Butch, and I like the addition of Mike McCarthy there. I agree. Very nice move by him. Let's go around the horn before we end the show. EJ, your Browns are at home on Sunday taking on the L.A. Chargers. I know you're going to be watching that. Uh, What's uh, in store for you, sir, this week? Not much going on. Definitely going to make sure I watch that Browns game. You know what? With with the way that defense is playing, uh, I I will pick the Browns to win that game in a low-scoring matchup. I'll pick them to win that game. Uh, 17 to 10 at home. Baker Mayfield throws for one touchdown. I like it very much. EJ, thanks for joining us, and we will talk to you in a couple yeah. weeks here on the game. Sounds good. All right, and then uh, Butch Davis, I know you're going to be busy covering uh, the Wings, the Pistons, and such, and you can find your show, or we can find your show online here at thegamesportshow.com. Butch, what do you have in store this week before, well, actually, in the next couple of weeks, as it will be a couple of weeks before we have a show again? Well, a couple of weeks, we'll start with tomorrow there. We will go over some of the high schools who have made it into the playoffs, and we'll also go over some high schools uh, that maybe have an opportunity to get in the playoffs there, as that's not finished yet there. We're going to exclusively uh, do a good, good period of, of uh, the show tomorrow on High school, uh, the high school sports and whatever it may be. Not only that, but look at what's in the wicket for volleyball, per se, and also some cross country. As almost this time is coming for cross country to have their state uh, runoffs and whatever it may be in there. We're going to deal with that tomorrow. Exclusively just deal with a lot of high school stuff there and kind of get the, the pro ranks of rest. We'll, we will do some pro stuff, but uh, exclusively the high schools tomorrow there. And also we're just, uh, trying to deal with the Pistons, per se. And um, also, uh, golly, it's a bye week next week for the Detroit Lions. And I'm on, you know, hey, I'm kind of excited because I don't have to worry about none of it at all. You know, golly, you sleep in and uh, watch TV or let the TV watch me. Absolutely. Butch Davis joining us on the game again. You can find his show on this Web page, podcast page, or his page, Simply Butch 2. That's TOO.Potomatic.com. Butch, thanks for joining us, and we will talk to you in two weeks here from the Wicked Sister on the game. Will do. All right, that's going to do it here on the game. Don't forget, Dave McKegg will have his shows this week from Sports Center, Bar and Grill, and Northern Superior Brewery. Butch will have his shows over the next couple weeks, and we'll be back here for the game at the Wicked Sister on Monday, October 22nd. So until then... Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night. Keep it locked here to the game on Eagle 95.1. See ya.